right, Shabbat Shalom, fam. Shabbat Shalom. Welcome back. Welcome back. Told out for tuning in. Told out for tuning in. Before we get started, we're going to give our praises, honor, and glory to our Father, to our Elohim above, for giving us the ability on this Shabbat day to review the information of His people, to review the information of His hidden ones, His scattered ones, His dispersed ones. Beyond the rivers of Nubia, beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, right? So without further ado, we're going to be getting into the history of the Ga Adambe people of Ghana. All right, we're going to review their traditions, customs, and culture and show how they are descendants of Israel. All right, and through their migration, they fulfill um, in Zephaniah 3.10, that's all other like tribes, right? So without further ado, we're going to get a brief overview of these people. So who are the God people, all right? Who are the God people? The God people are also known as the God Dangbe or the God Dame, all right? They are an ethnic group in Ghana and Togo. The God and Dangbe people are grouped respectively as part of the God Dangbe ethno-linguistic group, all right? The God Dangbe's are one ethnic group that lives primarily in the greater Accra of Ghana, all right? So they're one ethnic group. The God-speaking peoples were organized into six independent towns, Accra, Osu, Labadi, Teshi, Nunga and Tima. Each town had a store which served as the central object of God ritual and more and war magic. All right, Accra became the most prominent God town and is now the capital of Ghana. So when we're thinking about these God people, these God Adami people, they are um, throughout Ghana and Togo, and more, more, more um, prominent and more populated in Accra. All right, Lower Ghana. So now we're about to get into um, this book here, Traditions and Customs of Gadambis of Ghana, all right, descendants of authentic biblical Hebrew Israelites. So we're going to start at the very top. It states, debate goes on unupdated as to the origins of the Gadambis people. There are those who believe or contend that the proto Gadami people came from somewhere east of the Accra Plains, while other school of thought suggest a distant locale beyond the West African coast. In spite of such linguistic and historical theories among scholars, it is agreed that the Gadambe people settled in Accra Plains by the 13th century. However, all history has it that the Gadambe people, Sha, La, Ada, Osuduku, Jibugbla, Prom Prom, and Ningo migrated from Israel, all right, migrated from Israel through Ethiopia, then, excuse me, migrated from Israel through Egypt, then to Ethiopia and southern Sudan and settled for a period of time at Sameh in Niger, and then to Elife in Nigeria, all right, so we see the typical Israelite migration through Egypt, through Ethiopia, west across Sudan or Sahara. It goes on to say, during the period 100 AD or 1100 AD, they migrated again. The Gadambe settled first at Dahomey, all right, and later traveled to Hatsi in Togo, where they stayed for a short season, all right. More or history had it that the nucleus of the Gadambe originated in Goshen, all right, and arrived in the Gold Coast via an early route, which started immediately in the Upper Egypt and Abyssinia, which is Ethiopia. Having crossed the Volta River in a parting of the waters reminiscent of Moses' parting of the Red Sea, the ancestors of the Gadambes or the Gadambes, comprising in the main direct and partial descendants of the two tribes of Gad and Dan, all right, found the La Nemo kingdom. Also, or history had it, that the Gadambe people claimed their origin in Israel in the Middle East from where they migrated into different groups through Upper Egypt and along the Nile River in Ethiopia and subsequently through Benin and Nigeria, right? So no matter what oral history we got on these people, it always goes back to Israel with the same migration route through Egypt, Ethiopia, west across the Sudan, all right? It goes on to say the Gadambes then settled in various places, including the grassy and water-starved coast of present-day Accra, all right? The capital of Ghana, the Gadambes that settled along the coast took to fishing in the many lagoons which dotted their domain and later turned to sea fishing. The forest Gadambes became farmers of cash crops such as peppers, okra, tomatoes, corn, cassava, and etc. 
continuing on. It goes on to say the Syrians or Syrians were said to have had numerous confrontations with the Gadambes. All right, so we got to peep the language. It says numerous confrontations with the Gadambes. So when was the first one? Or history had it that they left Israel around the sixth century BC. All right, we know that um the the ten tribes were exiled, uh, circa seven hundred um right twenty two BC into Assyria. All right, so um, we shouldn't be surprised to see Israelites um, in the land during the 6th century BC just because we see um, within 2nd Ezra uh, chapters 13 that it would be Israelites left within the land. Also, we see within 1st Chronicles and various other scriptures, we see Northern Kingdom Israelites um, within, a, within um, Jerusalem keeping Passover who had just returned out of the hands of the kings of Assyria. All right. So we shouldn't be shocked to see um, Nordic Kingdom Israelites still in the land during this time. But let me start off from the top. Again, it says the Syrians were said to have had numerous confrontations with the Gadumbes, or history had it that they had left Israel around the 6th century BC. They passed through Egypt and probably lived in Egypt briefly. From Egypt, the Gadumbes went to northern Ethiopia in the Ganda province where the Blue Nile originates. They were led by a high priest known as Wolomo. They worshipped the Nile and Wilomo became the high priest of the Nile. When they reached their present abode in Ghana, they thought that the surrounding ocean was an extension of the Nile. Hence the reference made to Naya Wilomo. It is Nile Wilomo and not Nai, probably due to the mispronunciation of the word Nile. The Gadambes are said to have relocated from Ethiopia or northern Ethiopia to Sudan in 640 BCE following another attack by the Syrians, all right. So around 640 BC, they got into the Sudan because they were just attacked again by the Assyrians, all right. By the Assyrians, it goes on to say the they became in contact with the Khans in Sudan in 640 BC. And just a quick break. If you watched my video concerning the Khan, um, Khan, the Khan from Canaan to Ghana. You would know that the Khan actually has the God people or the Gadambe people in their or traditions, in their migrations routes as coming into Ghana with them. So once again, we have these or traditions that's very strong and lining up. It goes on to say, it was at the same time the ancient Ghana Empire developed and flourished, all right? And I wanted to touch base on that Assyrian um that Assyrian attack, all right? Because um, it said that the Gadambes had numerous attacks um, from the Assyrians, right? And um, with them being Northern Kingdom Israelites, it would make sense that they was first attacked by the Assyrians, right? Um, up in Assyria or within Israel when they came and got them, right? Uh, we know based off the scriptures, they went back west over the Euphrates. Some came down, stayed in Jerusalem as outlined in the scripture, right? Some will remain in its borders as we see some keeping Passover, and some will continue. All right. So when the sixth century BCE came, right, we also know that's when um you had some Babylonian activity in Israel. So just to make this make sense, when the sixth century BCE came, we see Egyptian presence or Assyrian presence within the same places the Gadumbes went. Now, the Gadambe say that they got attacked by the Assyrians again in northern Ethiopia. So, near Nubia, right, near Kush, lower, lower Egypt, right, upper Ethiopia, during that area. The funny thing is, we see in 667 BCE, we see Assyrians in the same location. Alright, so it's pretty accurate of what they have going on as far as the timeline that we can definitely see. Or um, get an idea that they were indeed attacked by Assyrians again because they did go all the way down into Ethiopia. They did go into Egypt. They did go into Nubia and the Sudan. All right. With armies. With Assyrian armies. All right. And like I said, you can um, look this up. The first campaign of Taraqua. And you can get more information on this. But indeed, Assyrians was in this location around this time. So it, it's more than likely true that they did get another attack, especially when the Syrians found out that uh, this Northern Kingdom Israelites um, down below in Ethiopia. So that that's, I feel like that's a, a pretty hard hitter within their oil traditions. But continuing on, it says 
and the Ghana Empire was subsequently attacked by the Berbers from North Africa. This led to the disintegration of the Ghana Empire. They got numbers and possibly others, right? We know the Akan left the um, Kingdom of Ghana or the Ghana Empire as well. Others began to migrate south, some by land and some by sea. And just to get a quick reference to the ancient Kingdom of Ghana or Mali, we're going to go to Black Christian Nationalism. It says, in fact, in the ancient kingdom of Ghana, which is now called the Republic of Mali, there were many Jews from the Western Sudan, all right? And we know that the Gadambes just told us they left Egypt, went through Ethiopia, and went through the Sudan and came west, all right? So they came from, they were Jews that came from the Western Sudan who went through the Sahara Desert and settled in the ancient West African kingdom and became part of that society and tradition until the Berbers came from the north and they migrated down south. All right, so we just verifying everything our people saying. Also, make mention to that after the times of Sennacherib would have been around the sixth century BC or any time after the uh, times of Sennacherib, really. But we see in the sixth century BC they were said to um start their migration in the Sudan, and it's funny because we have um. A Jew by the name of Eldad the Danite, who recorded, you know, the tribes of Dan and other northern kingdom Israelites um, dwelling beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. And even Eldad himself was from Nego land itself. But Eldad, son of Mali, alleged that he was a descendant of the tribe of Dan. He related that his tribe had migrated from their Palestinian home so as not to take part in the civil war at the time of Jerusalem's secession and were residing in the land of Avila beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. And if you was to look at the, the um, also another Jewish traveler, right, our people, if you was to look at Benjamin of Toledo's work, I should have added that in, but Benjamin of Toledo's work tells us that Havila was what, about, Havila was about 50 days from the Sudan and that the Havila was in the ancient kingdom of Ghana, all right? The Havila of the scripture was in the ancient kingdom of Ghana. That's, that's what um, Benjamin of Toledo tells us. And he said there was many Jews there. Right, but he goes on to say, the three other tribes, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher, were with him. These had joined them in the times of Sennacherib. All right, so we see that there's a tribe of Gad supposedly living on the other side of the rivers of Ethiopia, and this was stated all the way back in the day by Eldad the Danite. All right, by Eldad the Honey. So once again, we see that these um we can verify. These um, migration and these so-called um, tribes that they come from through other references, other sources, all right? Like he said, three other tribes, Naphtali, Gad, all right, Gad, Adambe, Gad, and Asher were with them, all right, beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. These had joined in the times of Sennacherib, all right, didn't the Gadambe literally migrate beyond the rivers of Ethiopia and claim to be from the tribe of Gad and Dan? Not to mention we have the Assyrian attack in the same area that they are in I see some strong world traditions going on continuing back to the book traditions and customs of the Gadumbes moreover it says homo festivals celebrated by the Gadumbes support their Hebrew Israelite origins you will review this in Exodus 11 12 13 and numbers 9 during the homo festivals I remember the God people they would paint the wooden frames or the entrances of their door houses with instusma. All right, instusma is a red clay mash and mixed with water, which was used instead of the blood of a lamb. In remembrance of what the angel of Yah told Moshe to tell the Israelites to do, when the Jews were under bondage in Egypt, by doing so, the angel of death would not kill the first male born of the Israelites. Moshe then told um, by the angel of Yah to tell the Israelites to feast. That is precisely what the Gadambe people do during the Homo War in accordance to their ancient Hebrew Israelite traditions. All right. So they still keep on um, the Passover and stuff that was passed down by the ancient Israelite forefathers. Next, we're going to go to a journal known as the Journal of Mother. All right. The Tongue, Biblical Hermeneutics and Theology. And of course, family, I will leave the links in the bio for all of this so you, you don't have to. Um, look for because I know a lot of this stuff be hard to find sometimes but we're going to start at the top where it says rulership so 
the rulership amongst the Gadambes or amongst the Dumbes is worthy of study with the reason that the Dumbe may that the Dumbe had a unique and distinctive system of rulership. Their rulership style is absolute theocracy, thus a system of governance where rulers were priests with divine intuition. The primeval Dangbe had a system of governments like the ancient Hebrews before the time of the monarchy. Hence the idea of the chieftainy in stools is quite borrowed. Akron got the careful study of the Ga Adambe or the Gadambe governance comments that this form of traditional governance can properly speaking be described as theocracy. Their rulers were just like the Israelites under Moses, Joshua, and the judges. Their rulers were just like the Israelites under Moses, Joshua, and the judges. All right, so where would they get this um, rulership mindset, this governance, this theocracy from? Their Israelite forefathers. It goes on to say, a straight line can be drawn from the Israel's priestly experience to that of the Dangbe. The ruler here is a high priest or a spiritual leader whose rulership mandate is given by the deity of the land. In this case of Israel, Yahweh. The Danites invasion of the people of Lashish or Leshem, which is outlined in Judges of Joshua in the ancient Palestinian region of their exodus southward is the genesis of the Dangbe tribes. The paper attempted to trace the history of the Dangbe from their Palestinian route to West Africa. Their name, Lali or Lele, is one of the visible signs by which they preserve their cultural traditions for prosperity. All right, so. Um, the Dadagambes were one of the tribes that were able to preserve a lot of their culture, the traditions, and prosperity. All right, we know that the Most High, you know, what I'm saying, put us, put us away or scattered us for going off, for committing idolatry. All right, for 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 worshiping idol gods. So this is very important when we see some of our people still maintaining those cultural traditions. All right, that's very important. But we're going to continue on, and we're going to pull something very interesting out of this book, uh, Revelation, the movement of the Khan people from Canaan to Ghana. And we're going to pull something out of this book because um, the Khan break their name down into three um, different elements, and I think it's very interesting. All right, because like I said, uh, the Khan records the God Adambe within their um, or traditions as migrating with them and as being Israelites. But it says the origin of the god Adan Jibe, or Jibi, the name of the god Dambe, is composed of three different elements, all right? God, Adan, and Jibi. God forms a component of Gabai, literally. God came from the biblical. Gabai means pride. He was one of our foreparents from the tribe of Benjamin, who settled in Jerusalem after their Babylonian exile. Now, could this um this God element mean that they are from the tribes of Benjamin? No, I don't believe so. I believe it still means they're from the tribe of Gad, but like they said, that God forms a component of Gabai, which is a biblical Hebrew word, Gabai. So it's just showing that what? That Hebrew influence even throughout their names. It's possible that, you know, there could be Benjamites amongst the um God Dumbi, but according to 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 them and their old traditions, they're they're God and Dan. But I just like the way this broke this down from God into the Hebrew word Gabai. There could have indeed been children of God with this name as well, Gabai. It goes on to say Adon. It's the biblical Adon or Adon, said to be an unknown area in Babylon, a place where our Israelite four parents spent some time. All right, and it goes on to say Jibi. Jib is a transcription of the biblical Joboha, all right, Joboha or Jabada was the name of the fasting town located in the territories of the tribe of Gad, all right, that's what we used to hear, all right, Gadambe's territories or tribe of Gad. But like I said, I just wanted to pull this out because um, it broke these names down for us and it gave us a, a different look at it, basically, um, breaking it down into the Hebrew forms and words. And even right here with the GB, the location of um, territories of Gad, because these people do claim to be uh, from Gad throughout their old traditions. So, next I'm going to jump to the Ghana Bulletin of Theology. And this is Volume 5. This is Volume 5. But, like I said, I'll, I'll give you all the, um, the links for references. 
All right, so it says in one of his quarterly reports to the Basel Mission Committee in 1852, Zimmerman wrote a length about the integrity of the traditional African families he had observed. Despite the cultural decay that was all around them, he noted many families preserved a clear and stable partial, or what is this, patrial form suggesting the presence of a strong Old Testament influence. All right, and sorry about butchering that word. It goes on to say this, this observation led him to join in speculation that West Africans had ties to ancient Christian communities in Ethiopia. And is that so hard to think about, being that all of our Israelite brothers, majority of them have oral history as from coming from Ethiopia or spending some time in Ethiopia before going west across the Sudan? Right, that's what we've been saying. We've been bringing this out, you know what I'm saying? And in 1852, this same um, missionary noticed the same thing, that some of these people maybe had ties to the ancient Christian communities in Ethiopia, such as Axum and such as the, the kingdom of Simeon that was hugely populated by Israelites. Therefore, he reasoned, West Africans quite possibly represented a mixture of Semitic and Med cultural and racial strains. That's all we've been saying, family. That's all we've been saying. West Africans aren't just Semitic. There's more Semites or Semitic people in West Africa than it is Semitic. You're looking at the DNA, right? We've been telling these Semitic Negroes or Hermetic Negroes in West Africa. And this brother, or this European, noticed the same thing in 1852. It goes on to say, Unlike the observations of other basal missionaries in places like Abyssinia or on the River Niger, the god Agdambe might have been just one more of those tribes in Africa with an Israelite heritage, all right? And we're going to be bringing out some information to prove that. All right, we're going to bring out some information to prove that. Um, like, we already showed their oral traditions, all right? So according to their oral traditions, they do um, indeed come from Israel. But let's look at some of their culture and traditions and practices. To do that, we're going to go to a book, a new and accurate description of the coast of Guinea, divided into the gold, the slave, and the ivory coast. So it reads, The children are not circumcised Anywhere on the Gold Coast but Accra, all right? The children are not circumcised anywhere on the Gold Coast but Accra. And remember, when we're dealing with Accra, we're dealing with the God, like Dung Bay. But whence the custom of holding women unclean and circumcision of children should be derived from, I own cannot tell, all right? What do you say? Let me read that again. I own, I cannot tell. That's that old English right there. But it says, to carry it up as high as the Judaic time seems to me, a bit too far. Seems to me too far, right? But that's what we're going to carry it to. We're going to carry it all the way to Genesis 17, to the covenant between our ancestors and their children. That was passed down from our ancestors to the children of Israel. All right? This covenant, this is my covenant, I mean, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed. After thee, every man child among you shall be circumcised. All right? The children are not circumcised anywhere on the Gold Coast but Accra amongst the God Dumbay children. Now, this is important as well because even when we look around the world today, where are the most circumcised people located? Where are the most circumcised people located? Because remember, circumcision is a covenant between the Most High, right? And it's peoples. It ain't Israel. It ain't Arabia. It ain't um, Spain, Portugal. It ain't Khazaria. It's West Africa. Where the Israelites fled. That's where you can find the most circumcised people in the world. Continuing on. Those several Europeans favor this assertion, urging that the Negroes still retain several laws and customs which favor of Judaism. And that last mention. The honoring of the new moon, right, at the time of when the Jews began their festival, all right, and even we do that. To this day in America, we're looking at the new moon to tell when the new month coming, to tell when we need to blow our trumpets, you know what I'm saying, to tell, or to even make sure that our feast days are falling on the right time, lining up with the moon and the new moon. So we know this is uh, an ancient custom that we used to do. Uh, it also says the marrying of their brothers, wives, and several more, which seem the same in effect, as well as the names of which 
here are several which occur in the Old Testament, all right? And we're going to review some of those names once we get wrapped up of all those names that um, can be found in the Old Testament. So the question would be, where did they get these customs from, these names and everything that they're doing? And mention, remember right here it says they marry, the marrying of their brother's wife and several more. We see that in the scripture as well. An example of that is Deuteronomy 25 verse 7. It reads, and if the man like not to take his brother's wife, all right, so if he don't want to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate unto the elders and say what? And say this. My husband brother refuses to raise up into his brother a name in Israel. All right. So he refuses to do what he's supposed to do. He refuses to raise up and take his brother place and take his brother a name in Israel. And he will not perform the duty of my husband's brother because that was known that if your brother passed, you were supposed to step up, take that man's woman and bring forth fruit. But hey, like he said, like the author says, like the author says, um, Excuse me, like the author says, to carry it up as high as the Judaic time seems to me too far. But the question would be, where in the world did they get these customs? And there's your like ancestors. Now, I'm going to jump to this book real quick. I do not have the copy of this book anymore. The phone I had with the pictures in it of the, uh, of the uh, actual pages of the book, I don't have. Right, so this book I actually returned to the library a couple months ago. But fortunately, fortunately, I did write down a couple sources from it. And it gives us um, basically some good information. And it goes in with what we read or the conversation we're having about the God Dumbe people. Because um, this book, as you read, A Danish Jew in West Africa by Wolf Joseph. All right, um, this is about a Danish European Jew in West Africa. Specifically in Christenberg, Ghana, amongst the um, amongst the um, God Dumbays, all right, near Accra. So, also, if you was to go get this page or to get this book, you can find this information on the exact page, all right. You can find whatever you're looking. Well, you can find this specific quote on page 93, and whatever else I bring out, you can find on those pages that's listed below. But when he was here in, in um, Christenberg, near Accra, right, the bottom of Ghana, near the coast, he said, The songs they sing while paddling are a mixture of the Negro language, English, Portuguese, as well as Hebrew. All right? We know uh, that, what, 14th century, early 1500s, these Portuguese brews were expelled, sent to West Africa. Could there be some Sephardics absorbed into the God Dumbes? It's quite possible. Or they could have even just picked up this language from talking to Sephardics or European Portuguese traders. And we know that they would speak a little Hebrew just because they are Hebrews as well. Or at least retain some Hebrew tongue. There are in fact Jews here among the Negroes, alright? He says, there are in fact Jews here among the Negroes, he says. But the truth is that they are just as ignorant heathens as the others. And do not know where they originated. It's very interesting because even the so-called European Danish Jew observed that there are in fact Jews among these Negroes. But we're telling you most of them or all of the goddamn beds are Jews. But the truth is that they are just as ignorant heathens as the others and do not know where they originated. All right. So he noticed that these people are Israelites. They got the language. They doing this. They doing that. But it seems they don't know where they originated. He goes on to say when writing a parent, a, a, excuse me. He goes on to say, while writing a letter to his parents, that now, dearest parents, I shall continue by telling you an entertaining thing. During the first days of September, the Negroes celebrate their yam custom, which is much like our harvest festival at home. And it's held to the New Year, which is called the Black's New Year, in order to distinguish it from the White's New Year. At the yam's custom, there are most prominent Negroes are carried around in baskets accompanied by music and song with a large parcel over them. And I wish I had a video of this because I was just watching, you know, a video of the God people earlier. And I saw this exact scenario. I saw, you know, an elder or I guess you would say a prominent Negro being carried by the other gods, you know, on top of them. And he had a parcel over them and they were singing music and song. So this is this is um still happening even to this day. With our God Dumbe people, you know, and they even like to dress in white, make it look all pure. 
So, we got that. Let's jump to the history of the Gold Coast and Asante or Ashanti. Now, we're going to be dealing with the God people in this. All right, it says a reply to this it is the application, excuse me, appellation was given to the God tribe during the glorious days, yet it is applicable for all times for the present as well as for the future. Up here at four, it says from the beginning, when not corrupted by the Tisha people, they were strict observers of their religious rites. All right, a religion which appears to be a Jewish one, but now corrupted by fetishism. All right, so they said the religion of the God appears to be a Jewish one, not corrupted, but now corrupted by fetishism. They were entirely forbidden to have anything to do with human blood, even when a drop of blood is beginning to shed in an assault. Or by boys throwing stones, the king and elders are bound to make a sacrifice by way of purification. All right, by way of purification, and the parties are t are fine. It goes on to say, we say a Jewish one, which we will prove by a few leading facts in their system of observance. All right, and a key thing to notice here, it says that what they have to do a sacrifice by way of purification, and we see purification sacrifice in the scripture. An example is Leviticus 4, chapters, excuse me, chapters 4, verses 13 to 15. Verse 13 says, And if the whole congregation of Israel sin throughout ignorance or through ignorance, sin, the thing be hidden from my eyes of the assembly or from the eyes of the assembly, and they have done somewhat against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which should not be done and are guilty. When the sin which they have sinned against it is known, then the congregation shall offer a bullock, a young bullock for they sin, all right, and bring him before the tabernacle of the congregation, all right. Just like it said right here, the kings and elders are bound to make a sacrifice by way of purification, all right. They're doing the same thing. They're making a sin offering, where they're about to offer a young bullock for the sin of Israel. They brought him before the tabernacle of the congregation. Verse 15, and the elders of the congregation shall lay their hands upon the head of the bullock before the Lord, and the bullock shall be killed before the Lord as a purification sacrifice. Same thing amongst our people. The Ebos do this. The Khan do this. The God Dumbe do this. So where are they where are they getting these customs from? Everybody like to dismiss what our people have been doing for thousands of years to try to say. Oh, it just rubbed off on it from influence. Like, no, brother. No. This was taught by their ancestors, the Israelites. The circumcision with which every male child of 6 to 10 years of age is to undergo. Slaves of that age are also circumcised. So even our Gandambe brothers had slaves. Let's not get it twisted. At the yearly harvest fest called Homowo, the doorposts or the walls are painted with red clay similar to what the Israelites did at their Passover, at which time all differences existing in a family must be settled in peace. Were several other things which we can adduce but shall treat of in the customs of the Acres. Right, and we also see another scripture reference to this. Um then I'm putting red on the dough post in Exodus 12 and 7, and they shall take blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat. So again, Old Testament traditions, customs, mosaic laws. All right, so some Gadambe names of Hebrew slash Israelite origin. To the left, you can see all the Gadambe names, and you can to the right, you can see all the uh, scripture references to where you can find these names. Nicola, right, Ammon, or Ammon, Amasa, Ashlel, Dizani, Abi, Ari, Alunu, Kushi, Mensa, Ashi, Dudu, Gama, Ashiti, Adi, Mo, Sha, Abele, Quel, Koshi, Ahi, Taki, Adu, Osa, Kom, Boy, Saban, right, Nate, Yau, Ga, Timen. Yarili, Oto, Ifi, Gadame, Ana, Ga, Saka, Do, Aya, Aya, Adama, Abeka, Mensa, Amani, Ku, Saromi, and Nate, or Nathan. So we see a lot of, you know, Hebrew words amongst them, Old Testament, New Testament. The thing would be, where did these influences or, you know, this, this, this culture appropriation come from? 
who brought these customs and traditions into Ghana for these people to pick up on. Yo, you already know my Elsa family. They always had them, and they've been observing them and practicing them throughout their migrations beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. Another thing to take note to is that Accra, all right, Accra is actually, is actually a ancient city within a Jerusalem. We see it's right next to what Mount Moriah, right next to what Zion, the city of David, right, and it's surrounded by the Valley of Jehoshaphat. So ancient Accra is indeed in Jerusalem. So the question would be, where in the world did this one come from? Who named it? Who named it? I rest my case. We also go to verses like Genesis 35, verse 14, and Numbers 28 and 7, and we can continue to see traditions and customs of the God Adambe. We see stuff such as a pillar of stone, right? This white thing is a pillar of stone that's outlined in Genesis 35, 14. And Jacob set up a pillar of stone in the place where he talked with him. Even a pillar of stone and he poured what? A drink offering thereon and poured oil thereon. All right. And that's what we see. Anybody know about these green bottles in the West African culture tradition? These are indeed what we call, I guess you could say strong drinks or purposely poured for libations or drink offerings. So this is what we have here. We see what's going on in Genesis 35 verse 14. We see the pillar of stone with the drink offering get ready to be done. We also see a sacred incense. And even when we look at Numbers 28, 7, it says that the drink offering thereof shall be a fourth of him for one lamb in the holy place. Thou cause the strong wine to be poured out into the Lord for a drink offering. So we see a lot of traditions and customs of our, of, of, of our ancient Israelite forefathers still being preserved amongst our people to this day. Even I found this very interesting, all right? This so-called Sankofa bird, which was found between the 14th and 12th century BCE. So around the time of, um, around the time the Exodus just happened and the children of Israel getting into the land, all right? Getting into the promised land. It's called a ivory pixis in the shape of a duck used as a container for consecrated oil or cosmetics. All right, and this was found in the tomb of Israel. And I just wanted to bring this out because I see that it's very interesting that our women right here that we see have or are holding up a certain thing or a certain bird that looks very similar. Right. That looks very similar with the turn back head. Right. With the turn back head, the beak facing the same way and everything. And not to mention, we see this custom amongst other Israelite clans. Right. This isn't the only tribe that, you know, has this or use this during festivals. So my question would be, or my guess would be, specifically, is that this is another tradition, you know what I'm saying, that was brought from Israel by our people. Finally, we can look at a map. Adambe Aikushi left Israel for Ethiopia slash Sudan. From there, one of his descendants, Nicolia, moved to West Africa in 1422. All right, we see the great immigration from Israel, led by the famous Nicolia. Israel, Ethiopia, through the Sudan, west across the Sudan or the Sahara to Nigeria, Benin, Togo, Ghana. And here's another portrait or portrait. And here's another portrait of the Israelite origin of the Gadambes and their migration. In conclusion, Gadambes customs of circumcision. Of their male born, the outdoor or sanctification and naming of the Gadambe newly born baby on the eighth day after birth is in ordinance with their ancient Hebrew custom and their patriarch or paternal or patrilineal traditions further lead support to their claim that they are Hebrew Israelites of origin. The Homo Wolf Festival celebrated by the Gadambes supports their claim that they are Hebrew Israelites as well, descendants of Jacob. One many note. Well, one may note that in the traditions of the Gamashe in Accra and other areas of Greater Accra, the Gadambe is used to paint the doorposts with their houses or the doorposts of their houses with blood of a lamb during the Homo Wolf Fest. All right? This was done to commemorate what the angel of Yah told Moses. It goes on to say the doorposts of the houses were painted with blood of the lamb 
which would let the angel of Yah know that those houses belong to the Hebrews. This is exactly what the Gadambe do during the Homo festivals. In subsequent years, the Gadambe replaced the blood of the lamb with a red clay mud along as his stuzma, which we um, brought out earlier. This was because the lamb became too expensive for our people. So, in conclusion, the Gadambes definitely migrated from Israel according to um, or traditions. The Gadambes descend from basically Gad and probably Dan as well, um, just based off the or traditions. We see that they were attacked by the Assyrians in northern Ethiopia, right? The same time the Assyrians were in that area. So we see that that um, tradition is very strong. Um, we see the traditions and the customs of these people that show that they um, basically are keeping the laws, customs of the Old Testament. So once again, we, we was able to verify this stuff through the, through the um, reviewing a couple of information, reviewing a little history about our people in Ghana. And of course, this is just part one. This is just part one. We're going to continue to dig on our people. Uh, we're going to continue to do what Job 8 and 8 says. Prepare and search for our fathers, you know. Because that's what we have to do. Uh, we have to connect back with our people. We have to bridge those stones. And we have to, you know, bring back these two sticks. All right. Judah shall not vex Ephraim. We got to, um, you know, bring together the, the diaspora and the, and the ones who was left behind. All right, the ones who was able to escape, the ones who was able to not be taken and changed and scattered. Because our family are still there. All right. And we're going to end this video by um, taking a listen to an elder of the God Adambe people and see what he has to say about um, basically his people and surrounding kinsmen. And like I say, Shabbat Shalom. Um, we may be back on earlier or later on today. We'll see. If not. Um, just stay in tune and stay um, on the lookout for the Sephardic Jews video part three. It will be a treat. It will be a treat. Shalom, family. Be sure to tune in for this last part of the video. You mentioned that they settled at um, Ilefi yes. at a point. Yes. I know that the guns also settled at Ilefi. Yeah, yes. So do they have a relation over there? That's a relationship. In fact, Ga and Dangbe, they are the guard family from Jacob. You know, okay. Jacob had two sons. Yes. One is God. God. Mm -hmm. So Ga and Dangbe, God. Ga and Dangbe. Oh, okay. Then the, we are the Judah. Mm -hmm. The are the Judah group. Yeah, from the tribe of yes. Judah. And even at Kans, they are the Levites. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, you, see, you all stayed in all Ghana together. Mm -hmm. And on the, the day of migration, they moved southwards. So they entered the forest areas of Ghana. But we went eastwards to Ilefe before meeting here again. Oh, okay. 